Conflict is a central feature of social life. We experience it in our personal relationships, in our family and work life, in and between the groups we belong to, and in the societies in which we live. Conflicts are not simple. Often many people are involved and many issues are at stake. People's feelings, perspectives, and behaviors change over time. Because of this, conflict is inherently complex. Precisely why resolving conflicts in our relationships, workplaces, and societies can be so difficult. This video shows how one academic paradigm, dynamical systems theory, can be applied in practice to illuminate the complexity of conflict and seek out simple, sustainable solutions. In this case, students are considering a multi-party conflict in Nigeria. The process begins with mapping exercises that help stakeholders visualize a complex relationship between events during the conflict's history. These maps enable parties to identify underlying issues, hidden patterns, and opportunities for intervention. Parties then join together to envision a peaceful future before thinking critically about what might cause conflict to re-emerge. Stakeholders identify specific steps required for positive change before reflecting on unintended consequences that their actions might produce. Dynamical systems theory sees each conflict as a unique system of interconnected actors, issues, and processes. Applying DST begins with a mapping process, an exercise that allows users to make the connection between the events and actors in the conflict's history. Stakeholders are asked to draw the conflict as they perceive it, going as far back as they feel appropriate. Events are circled and linked with arrows that show how each event led to another event or inhibited another event from happening. The process allows the participants to visualize the events that brought them there. In this idealized version, you can see how events in a conflict's history are linked to each other, and also to underlying factors that reinforce or inhibit the conflict over time. This approach to mapping reveals how even a very complex system can be understood by relatively few variables, in this case underlying conflict drivers, depicted here in bold circles. Mapping in this way also helps identify feedback loops. These non-linear relationships between and among events and issues can have a powerful de-escalating or escalating effect on a conflict, such as a cycle of revenge killing, for example. In this case, the mapping process helped this actor perceive what he was contributing to the conflict, despite his positive intentions. We claimed, you know, when we kind of took a side with Rimbo, that we recognized that we may have contributed to the unrest. <coughs> Um, and we don't mean to, and we didn't see that until we started seeing all these different connections and how um, even you know with the Catholic, you know we're affiliated with the Catholic Church, and even if one person hears it, then we're contributing to that, and it's something that we're going to um, try to remedy. Following mapping, the second phase of applying DST involves identifying actionables. That is, events or issues that could be infected in order to induce a positive change in the complex system. This is done by identifying central hubs of energy on the map, circled here in red, which have a lot of arrows going in and out. Having identified important causal patterns in the maps they have generated, participants can find practical, actionable suggestions for resolving the conflict based upon a more nuanced understanding of how it came into being. In a multi-party conflict, sharing maps and the actionables the parties have identified helps to broaden groups' understanding of the conflict and move towards collective problem solving. In this stage, parties develop a better understanding of each other's point of view, see common factors that maintain the conflict or offer opportunities for positive change, reveal conflict goals while also seeing opportunities where collaboration might fulfill mutual interests. Building up refers to the process where stakeholders envision a better future based upon the problems and potential solutions identified in earlier stages. Participants are gathered into mixed stakeholder groups. Together, they're asked to envision their ideal future, as well as the processes that are necessary to build this future. What would this future look like? What would need to be in place to get there? Often, it is challenging during this stage for parties to think in terms of long-term goals rather than responding to immediate needs and pent-up grievances. In bringing parties together, the facilitator must recognize the potential for conflict that might disrupt participants' desire and ability to envision long-term positive outcomes. The teardown stage serves as a reality check for the positive future we have envisioned. With a better future in mind, 
What would return the parties to destructive conflict? What forces are inhibiting positive change? What processes, events and institutions need to be in place in order to safeguard the future envisioned in the build-up phase? Here, one of the stakeholders is talking about how his tribe would consider a return to violence if none of their needs were met. We could withdraw from the town uh, and we could say, sorry for attacking you. Um, <laughs> or we could get some AK-47s, we could attack that town, blow up the Exxon Mobil uh, headquarters, because we think that we've actually managed to have some positive progress by attacking. It's kind of brought all of us together. So we're thinking about that, but if we chose a path of peace, perhaps we could look at collaborating with some of the other stakeholders that have the same interests. This phase focuses on practical steps that are needed for lasting change. In a full group discussion, each stakeholder is asked to suggest ways in which they could positively contribute to the peace process moving forward. Um, so those forms for two weeks of conversation um, that would could be launched with a more public apology about maybe negligence that happened in the past. Um, and then working with the government to develop or to, to adhere to your accountability standards. It's important to note that the entire process can generate tension along the road to finding solutions. Here, one participant then reflects on what she has heard. I'm asked the question, you know, what, what two things could we do? I was really thinking about my own position. There's very little that I can do sort of in a physical way. I suppose the only thing I could do would be to be willing to sort of start from zero and, and, and not hold on to the, to the um, issues that have happened in the past. It just would be... You know, I was asked one of the facilitators, would you be willing to do that? And really the answer is no, you know, because the, the, the effects are very real and very dire right now. So when you're talking about a, a public apology form of some kind, that would really go make, uh, that would really go far in helping me get there where I can say, okay, you know, let's start at zero and see what we can do going forward. Returning to the view of conflicts as a system of interrelated events, actors and motivations, the final phase draws stakeholders' attention to the risk of unintended consequences. Knowing what they know now about how the conflict came into being, what can they expect to happen from the positive steps they're proposing? Like the tear down phase, this stage is important to balance the aspirational insights of the parties with the realities of what is practical on the ground. Here students reflect on their experience of the entire process. I really like the process because um, we're actually working together to formulate ideas and different hubs and creating these maps that other people can see because I think that's really important sometimes when you have a forum you're kind of screaming at each other and no one can physically see when you see is somebody's schematic end dates and, and, and all these things you can um, see similarities and differences mm -hmm. that opens up the dialogue so I think yes, I love the, the mapping part and the, the looking at it because it really they were you know, you had a position in mind, and then you came and you mapped it, and things sort of emerged, and you saw dynamics happen in front of you in a very visual way that was really interesting, and you, you know, were able to sort of, it got very creative, you know, you were looping things all over the place, and that was really cool. I was kind of surprised at how much, uh, or how well the process kept me away from focusing on an issue that was just like, I'm going to fix this problem, and the exercises and the way it's all structured, um, as you alluded to, as far as I'm not really talking at you, uh, the other people, it made me think about, um, I don't know, it just kept me busy and I wasn't able to focus on an enemy um, because the activities don't allow that. And also that something that just came out of it naturally was um, realizing our role in it in a way that I wasn't like trying to get my peers to do. It just happened and I was like, This simulation was part of a graduate course at Teachers College at Columbia University. If you want to learn more about this course, more about the research involving dynamical systems theory, or more about how it is applied in practice, please consult these links.